New technology is always coming out. Cryptocurrency is a big one, NFTs, etc. And people are talking about the morality and ethics around them. So if you knew that technologies like those were being used for illicit activities, would it prevent you from using them in the future? That would affect my use of crypto if I knew. Bitcoin is good, the NFTs are good, but I'm old school. I'm not going to let that control my life. Yeah, you can buy some illegal things, but I don't know, on real life, we could use and buy those things too. So I don't know, maybe we can start from the education. But the shift that's going to happen with the crypto market and that being our new form of currency, which is going to happen, you want to be smart. Like you can become a millionaire off of it. You have to look at the trends. You have to yeah. be realistic. And one thing I say, play the game, don't let it play you. You have to be smart in everything that you do. This is the United States of Anxiety. I'm Kai Wright, and welcome to the show. We're talking tonight about moral choices. And I'll say this episode is prompted by a question that one of you sent to us. So let me bring in Kusha Navadar, who is one of our producers who you are used to hearing from whenever we go through the listener mailbag like this. Hey, Kusha. Hey, Kai. So set this up for us. What question came to us and in response to what? Yeah, last month we did an episode about cryptocurrency, the promise and failure of the technology to level the financial playing field. One of you listening at home heard this episode and sent us a provocative question. Hey, Kusha, this is Tim from Brooklyn. Just listened to the episode on crypto and wanted to know a little bit more about the moral implications of putting your money into a market or a coin that seems so likely to be used for nefarious purposes, drugs, human trafficking, etc. Seems like Bitcoin and those kind of cryptocurrencies can be a little dangerous. Thoughts? Thank you, Tim. Kai, I love this question, but here's the challenge. How do you actually answer a question about morality? It kind of sounds like you need a philosopher. Yeah, uh, so I called one. You called a philosopher? Yeah, Dr. Christopher Robichaud. He's actually an old professor of mine, too. Right. Senior uh, lecturer in ethics and public policy at Harvard. He's also really good at explaining philosophy through superheroes. So we talked about Tim's question. Here's what Dr. Robichaud had to say. So, Dr. Robichaud, I am so excited to see you again. And right at the top, I just want to ask, have you ever heard of a question like Tim's before? I think it's a great question. I, I have heard this question before. More than that, I've asked questions like this of myself. And behind it is a deep issue that we face with a whole bunch of other things besides crypto, which is, mm -hmm. do we want to play a part in broad enterprises that we know or have good reason to believe are at least deeply morally problematic. Uh, that's something that's an unavoidable question that all of us face living the kinds of lives that we live today. I mean, folks in, in my courses all the time will, you know, come to me with questions like, you know, I feel bad about participating in a capitalist society, or I feel bad about eating meat, or I feel bad about buying this clothing line. And it's more than just, I feel bad, right? But behind that is this, I think, pretty deep question, which is where do we draw the line for ourselves when we know in some sense that we're a vector of suffering, that we in some way uh, contribute to it by participating in it? Yeah, and crypto seems especially tricky because uh, for a lot of people, it appears at least the promise of it is a way to take back financial power. During the episode we did last month, I'd say we found a lot of tension, like a lot of people saying, hey, listen, this is a way for me to get ahead in this financial world that isn't really set up for me. Maybe it is for others, but not for me. Does that does that factor tip the scales one way or the other? So it's pretty easy to say I'm going to take a moral stand about on something because it has no benefit for me anyways, and I don't want to do it. Right. Other people don't have those sorts of choices. But what you're introducing is the thought that, well, for some people, investing in crypto, say, um, really does come with some promise of some benefits. But I do think that if you really do believe, for instance, with crypto, that it does contribute to some really morally horrific things, that's got to go into the calculation. I mean, the deep question, and I promised you, for better or worse, this is the sort of thing that I do. The deep question here is, you know, do moral reasons trump all reasons, mm. you know, um, if we sort of step back and be like, whatever else is true morally, this would be the wrong thing. Then that settles it. You're done. Uh, for other people, they're like, no, that just goes into the calculation, right? It, it could help me personally. It could benefit society in other ways. It's also morally wrong. I sort of fold that all together and come up with a result on what to do. Uh, I think that it's up to each individual to ask 
what they think comes with the conclusion, this is morally wrong. For some, that's going to be the end of the conversation. For others, it might just be the beginning. So can we take a step back a little bit, maybe? Just I'm thinking about somebody listening to this, and they're like, well, what what does morality even mean for money? I mean, uh, money per se is, to me, just a, a, a means of exchange. I think really the, the question we might be asking is, you know, what – what are moral ways in which to exchange goods and services, and what are some immoral ways to exchange goods and services? So I could imagine us saying, well, maybe the system of exchange that we're currently in uh, with the concentration of wealth amongst uh, very few and everyone else struggling, that is immoral. But money itself to me is is maybe a distraction. Mm. And so if currency, let's call it, on its face is amoral, should we think about crypto differently than maybe – the dollar bill? It's a great question. You know, I feel a little bit uh, unqualified to answer that question. <laughs> I think like anything else, something that really promises to be uh, liberating mm -hmm. uh, has something very positive and has something very negative. I mean, I, I constantly think, you know, in terms of analogies, uh, I'm old enough now to remember the birth of the internet, and I remember the early promise of it, which is everyone's going to be connected. You're going to be able to hear from everyone. Yay. And now the problem is that everyone is connected, and you can hear from <laughs> everyone. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, with, 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 you know, the positive comes from real negative, and I think it's healthy to always be stepping back and asking, all right, are there, let, let's at least try to make the goods outweigh the bads. You know, I love that comparison to the internet because it feels so similar to the conversation we're having now, right? I mean, even in the way that you just phrased it with that liberation. Uh, you know, one thing I love about your work is how you try to do it through analogies and specifically superheroes. When you talk about this idea of liberation and its promise and the two sides of the coin, does that evoke any example of maybe a superhero? Sure. I, I mean, um, I'll... I'll point to the obvious, but I think it's obvious because it's so powerful. You know, the last panel of Amazing Fantasy number 15, where we introduced to Spider-Man, comes, you know, Stanley writing the, the famous line, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Pete, look, you're changing. I know I went through exactly the same thing at your age. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. I really think it's important for us to know that the line is not with great power comes great responsibility. It's with great power, there must also come or there must come great responsibility. Now, the power is the liberating part. Peter Parker is a quite honestly, you know, poor, nerdy geek. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of options in front of him. And suddenly he's Spider-Man. Suddenly he can do amazing things. Suddenly he has a lot more opportunities in front of him. Stanley immediately comes in with, with, okay, well, you have a lot more power now. You have a lot more opportunities. Don't forget that there must come responsibility with the exercise of that. I think that money uh, is one way and one obvious way in which one can gain some freedoms. I think in some ways the entire narrative of superheroes is looking at individuals with tremendous power and asking ourselves, are they living a responsible life with this power? Mm. I'm old enough to remember when Facebook was being invented and the promise of that was, here's a way to you know, get people connected, meet up with your high school friends, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're at a point where we're asking serious questions about whether Facebook and other social networks, but this one seems to stand out, is is it eroding democracy? You know, is it did we use this new power, this new freedom uh, responsibly? What that makes me wonder, and this might be reducing it a bit too far, but isn't the moral thing to do maybe to get involved and steer it in a way that promotes good for society? Well, I'm always hesitant a little bit uh, to say what's the moral thing to do, right? Uh -huh. um, the thing I, I will always warn about, and this is true of all of us, um, we often go into some things thinking, I'm going to be the one to use this tremendous power wisely, and I'm going to be directing it towards great ends. And then, you know, they, they usually write, you know, tragedies about those mm. people. <laughs> and then they, right. they wake up one day and they're like, how did I end up an accomplice to all these horrible things? How did I? And of course, the story is never like this one moment. It's always this gradual erosion of one's moral character. I think this is true for people that serve in government or anything else as well. It's like, you know, you can always justify and rationalize something by saying, look, I'm just going to stay on the inside because um, there needs to be good done in here. And we do need good people on the inside. But that should come with a big warning that we are very easily seduced into thinking that we're doing good from the inside when we're actually just part of the problem. And it's hard to know without friends 
family and, and other support networks to help keep us honest about the role that we're playing. Let's bring it down to the individual, I guess, because that makes me think of Tim and the voicemail that he sent. So for Tim or somebody listening to this who might be thinking about how to navigate crypto or maybe eating meat, how do they operate? I would start by saying, well, I mean, you know, do you do you think that this is as morally uh, reprehensible as you think? If the answer is yes, I'd say like, all right, you know, are there costs for you not doing it? If the answer is yes, there's high costs, I'd be like, all right, well, now it's time to to think about weighing costs and benefits. I, I believe that, I guess the best way to put it is I believe that a moral life is constant work, really hard, and we're we're going to fail more often than we're going to succeed. I think that's okay. That's not meant to be doom. I think that most of the religious traditions say something like that. I think that the moral life is a hard life, and I think that when you raise moral questions, you should not run away from where they lead you to examining other parts of your life. And if they lead you to places where you go, my God, I might really need to change some stuff, uh, don't run away from that. And I know you might say all of that from a question about crypto, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but of course, because the question that we heard was, a, was not just about crypto, of course. It was a deep question about what we should do when we think we might be involving ourselves in something that's really morally problematic by our own lights, even if it would bring us some good. That question is going to show up again and again and again in our lives, and we can't, we can't run from it. Mm. Kusha, it really struck me when Dr. Robichaud asked in the beginning if moral questions should trump all other kinds of questions, because honestly, I don't really know how to answer that. Same. So I've got a follow-up question for everyone listening. Have you ever had to make the tough call in your life when morality took a backseat to other factors? What was the choice and how did you make it? Email us a recording of your story. Yeah, and I immediately think of stuff like continuing to eat meat when you don't have other options or investing in a company that does harm in the world. Well, funny you should say that. All these questions of technology, digital life, democracy, and inadvertent harm got me thinking about one company we'd all benefit from understanding a little bit better, Facebook, or as it's called now, Meta. In fact, I called up someone else to help me understand what we can learn from their history with regards to how we're living our lives online. Okay, wonderful. We will hear more about that in just a moment. Thank you, Tim from Brooklyn, for inspiring this conversation. And thanks to Dr. Christopher Robichaud, Senior Lecturer of Ethics and Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. We will be right back to pick up this Facebook discussion. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm Kai Wright, and I'm with our producer, Kusha Navadar, this week. And Kusha, before the break, you said you called up someone else to talk about Facebook. Yeah. I don't know about you, Kai, but for me, living online can be exhausting. Like, if you think of it as being a digital citizen, mm -hmm. determining what company is doing harm or good in the world is messy. And even just feeling like I have a choice in which platforms I need to be on is messy, too. Especially if I depend on digital to make money or stay in touch with people. Right, right. So you found somebody to talk to you about this. That's right. Shireen Ghaffari. She's a senior reporter at Recode, and she does this podcast I love called Land of the Giants. Their most recent season is about the story of Facebook, where it went wrong and where it's trying to go today. I called her up to talk through what we can learn from Facebook's story about how we live our lives online. You know, I, I thought about how I wanted to start the story, and I actually came to the point where you did start yourself. It was on a specific date, October 28th, 2021. Mark Zuckerberg, he's on screen at this virtual company event, and he makes a huge announcement. Tell us, what was that announcement? Why did it matter when you talk about that existential crisis that Facebook is going through right now? Right. So Mark Zuckerberg um, starts this special event, and he he makes a change that people had been whispering about, but no one knew exactly when it was going to come or what it was going to be. And it was that Facebook was rebranding itself. Um, and it's going to change its name to be Meta. And that from now on, the company would not be just a social media company, that the company's North Star would be this concept of the metaverse. Why did they do that? 
Well, you know, Facebook says this has been in the works for years, right, for a while. And, and you can see if you look back at Zuckerberg's comments over the past few years, he's been repeatedly talking about and investing in VR, AR, these futuristic goggles that you can wear, glasses on your head that will, you know, interpose basically a computer into your real life. But the moment comes at a time when Facebook is just coming off of uh, the huge leaks by the whistleblower Francis Haugen. Mm -hmm. It is facing this decline in its usership. It's seeing an aging user base on Facebook, right? Facebook's becoming more and more uncool. Younger users are on TikTok or other platforms. And so everyone is sort of thinking, or the elephant in the room is, is this, is this just a distraction from Facebook's problems? Is this Facebook trying to, you know, say, don't look over here at our aging and problematic social media platforms. <laughs> Come look at this, at this shiny new metaverse, which we don't fully understand or even know what it's going to be yet, but he sort of, Zuckerberg throws out this really, uh, you know, nifty and, and um, high def kind of set of visuals about what this, it looks like something straight out of a science fiction novel, like robots floating in the air and, um, you know, people like playing transported poker. to ancient Rome. Yeah, 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 playing poker in a spaceship and there's avatar version of Mark Zuckerberg making all kinds of corny, awkward jokes and being his sort of awkward self. <laughs> well, I know and, what that's like, so I can't <laughs> offer for that. <laughs> but but it, was, it was quite a moment and it really felt like he was trying to evoke sort of this almost Steve Jobsian type of big presentation that, that captures the, the world's attention and, and inspires people. And it... It, it, it wasn't quite received that way, I would say, just given the controversy and the state the company is in. And you feel like he was distancing himself from something. Can you say explicitly like what that something was that he was trying to distance himself from? I think from? it's just the baggage of the past. You mm. could hear it in his voice that he's ready to move on to something new. You know, he's a coder, he's an inventor, and he even says, you know, I'm most excited about building new products, new tools. And kind of the, the, the subtext there, or maybe what he isn't directly saying is that Social media is pretty old at this point by a technological standard. The concept of Facebook or even Instagram, it's not really innovative anymore, mm. right? So this this seems to be what Zuckerberg's running away from is, is the sort of stagnant medium of social media that he's he's come up with. Yeah, and something that has created a lot of complications too in society, right? Like you talk in your podcast so much about the trajectory of Facebook being one that they didn't expect, I guess, if that's fair to say, like along the way things happened that created a quagmire. I think the story of Facebook is, if you could sum it up in two words, is like unintended consequences, <laughs> like mm -hmm. both good and bad sometimes, unintended and that they've reached more users than probably anyone could have predicted in a very short amount of time. They had billions of people using the platform. On the other hand, they just time and time again, failed to see around corners about how people could exploit their platform, how Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp can draw out or encourage, enable, or at minimum just become a platform for some of the ugliest aspects of human behavior. Mm. Let's talk about the history a little bit, just tracking the big moments. When you were reporting, what was, and I guess now that you're done and kind of looking back, what was the first big moment that you identified in their history that uh, things started to go wrong. Can you walk us through that a little bit? If, if you go back to Facebook's early days, all there was was you look up someone's name, you see photos of them, and you see their what they call the wall, right? Mm -hmm. um, where people, your friends can leave comments or whatever. And it was more like a directory really initially than like the kind of robust social networks we know today. There was no no feed that we have now giving you updates on all, what your friends are doing and what the news is. So the first big kind of invention that Zuckerberg pushes out, the big change to his product that's really controversial is adding this news feed. I remember this. It was a, a big deal at the time. And the way you're describing it, it kind of sounds like a moment of original sin. Why was this such a fundamental and it sounds like irrevocable shift? When news feed is, was first introduced, it's a big change because people are used to, right, going and seeking out information, kind of like how you would use Google, right? Like you mm -hmm. type in someone's name and then you go see them and you see what's going on in their lives. Now you don't have to do anything. You can just sit back and relax with the invention of newsfeed and see a list that's constantly changing, right? Of who's going to what party, what photos they're tagged in. It's a massive change in just how people are consuming information on social media. And it was a big deal. People didn't like it. 
I would say this is the first time that Zuckerberg and the company face a very strong public backlash, a, a real like user protest. Um, there are these groups, Facebook groups had come out by then and people, you know, made protest groups saying like students against Facebook. Uh, they got, you know, like 60,000 more users in it, which at that time was a lot. Yeah. Uh, I think the most popular group on Facebook at that point was one of these protest groups. And Zuckerberg doesn't back down. Hmm. He keeps the news feed. And, you know, he, he kind of first he, he, he writes a blog post kind of flipping and dismissive of people's concerns saying like, relax, breathe, calm down. And then he becomes a little more apologetic, but he still doesn't really fundamentally change this idea that we're going to broadcast your information to your friends. And so is there something that you think could have been different about how it was handled looking in retrospect? I, I mean, in retrospect, you know, I could see a leader who's less sure in their footing uh, just canceling the the change, right? Mm -hmm. um, going, saying, my God, this is, we're getting our biggest user revolt ever. I mean, they kind of knew it would be controversial. At one point, they had uh, security guards outside their office. There was one group, we talked to an early product manager and engineer who, who helped develop this and, you know, unfortunately took a lot of the blame for it, even though she wasn't the only person working on it and everyone, the buck stops really with Zuck. But um, because her name was on the on the product rollout, they made a group called like Ruchi is the devil. You know, her name's Ruchi. You know, in another world, you could see Zuckerberg saying, this is a disaster, let's just stop. Mm. Uh, but he didn't. First, he, he kind of dismissed, then he apologized and he offered minor tweaks, but he doubled down that he knew best for users. He knew what users really wanted. Because even though people were protesting and making these groups, he looked at their behavior, mm. right? And he saw that it was popular. People were spending more time on Facebook. They were more engaged. This idea of sitting back and just letting the newsfeed tell you what to look at was drawing people in. And that's just become the default mode of how any social media network exists today is this idea of the feed. Yeah. And it's so cool that you brought up Ruchi Songvi, who is the yes. uh, engineer that helped make the newsfeed because right. uh, a quote of hers was actually one of the standout moments for me in the season so far. You, would you raise any anything or just change anything in the way you approached it at all? I think that to anticipate all of these things would have virtually been impossible. And in retrospect, had we been oracles and been able to predict all of these things, like it would have like probably stopped us in our tracks. I think the issue is like, you know, technologists as a as a genre of people are just optimists at heart. When you heard her say that, what did you make of that? I was both surprised and not surprised. And I kind of thought that maybe she would come up with some guardrails. Some, but she gave a much more kind of purest Silicon Valley answer to me, which is the part that's not surprising. Because what she says about optimism, I think, is really true and resonates with how most leaders in Silicon Valley talk to feel, which is that if you worry too much about how your product can be misused. If you sit there and you're kind of like Eeyore about it and say, well, this is all, this is all the way the world is bad and people can, you get stuck. So I actually think it was a pretty honest answer. And I, I kind of respect in a way that she, she, you know, was giving the most purest defense of, of social media and that you have to accept the bad that comes with the good. Yeah. And it really resonated for me too, because it was this idea that, well, if it's almost impossible to know everything 18 years from now. I can only yeah. look at right here. And I got to say, that seems reasonable if you think about all of the, the, just the impossibility of going through every single way or like looking into the future with you can't. So is it too high of a bar to tell people working on these products that they need to be oracles to guess what impact their technology will have a decade from now? Like, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think to some extent, you should be thinking about the common sense. You know, if, you, if you're building a car, you better think about if this car is safe for people to drive, right? Yeah. Like there's some outcomes anyone can predict. But when something as new as social media, and she was really one of the first people working on this concept of a news feed, I don't blame her for not knowing exactly how it would be misused. I think what you can start to put more blame around is when you're seeing early warning signs, and then to be fair to Rishi Sangvi, I think a lot of this happened after she left Facebook, but when mm. you're starting to see maybe in some countries outside the US like uh, Myanmar, how you know Facebook is being used in an increasingly polarized way that's potentially inciting violence and maybe leading to something that would later be known as a genocide, um, that's when you have to stop and say, okay, 
that was happening, you know, uh, the latest 2018, but in the, even the years before that. At what point does Facebook keep making sort of the same mistakes? At what mm. point does Facebook lose that that kind of innocent card of, well, we didn't know, we couldn't have guessed. Because at some point you can start to guess once your platform's used by millions of people around the world. So was there a point where you feel like you could say, okay, so we're in the news feed, it's, it's 2006, I think, right, that that comes out. Um, yeah. What was the next moment where maybe you could point to and say like, oh, same mistake, different, different, uh, different I mean, circumstance? To give Facebook and social media some credit for a long time, it kind of seemed like, wow, this is uh, bringing out the best in people mm. because you had movements, democratic movements. Um, you know, you had the Arab Spring happening on Facebook and Twitter. You had the launch of the young and charismatic President Obama coming up on Facebook and him using Facebook as a big tool, right, to, to get out the vote. Those aren't, in Facebook's view, bad things. These are great things. So they're seeing uh, how social media can be used to bring out the best in humanity. And I think it does take some time before you can even find, you know, kind of mass public events that, that are linked to social media in a really negative way. And I think that really ramps up around the 2016 elections and also around Myanmar uh, and the genocide, you know, around 2018, uh, but even in the years before that, that that's uh, being discussed on the platform. And so was the mistake, again, that they were dismissive of the warning signs or was it something different in that case as well? I think they were dismissive of the warning signs. And I think, look, like no one could have anticipated that you know, Russian troll farms were going to try to divide Americans in the election, even probably a couple years before that happened. But what you do see is when when the news first comes out, when people start finding evidence of this, that Mark Zuckerberg calls it a crazy idea that fake news could have, you know, impacted the election. And at that point, you have to ask, why are they not acknowledging this bigger issue, right? Which is not just, did technically this one Russian's troll account, sway this one voter. It's about, wow, our platform is being exploited and misused by people with bad intentions, by people who are trying to divide society. People are being maybe pushed to more fringe or extreme beliefs or hating each other more, some people, because in part of what they're seeing on our platform. That is something that you don't see the company fully reckon with. And I think instead you sort of see them in defense mode and saying, it's not such a big deal. Uh, guys, you don't, don't blow this out of proportion. And, and then it you know, the evidence just keeps coming that it is a bigger and bigger deal. And actually, I think it goes the opposite direction where maybe Facebook is blamed, in my opinion, maybe even too much for swaying the election sometimes, partly because they just didn't step up to that responsibility sooner. What do you think stopped them from doing that? I think it's partly that optimism. I really do think that it is the use cases that they envision oftentimes that these tech companies come from a limited point of view. Hmm. Think about who is at the top highest levels designing social media platforms. Are they people who have lived lives that are really directly impacted by cutthroat geopolitics? N no, like, you know, they're, they're not people maybe who have lived through uh, a genocide happening in their country or who are understanding how foreign adversaries could try to impact an election. I don't think you can expect someone sometimes with the life experiences that they have running these companies to maybe understand these problems as quickly as someone else might. I think that plays into it. I also just think there's an instinct to defend yourself, to defend your company. Mm. And um, you don't want to be bogged down by going and running a big investigation into exactly how the Russians misuse our platform. You just want to get more users. You want to make more profit. You want to keep going. You want to beat the competition. I don't know. You know, it's so hard to think in hypotheticals. And I, I do think it's, it is worth maybe playing out that thought experiment, though, of like, if it weren't Mark Zuckerberg, if it were someone who, again, let's say grew up in a country where they saw mass sort of anti-democratic movements rising, would they be more attuned to the early warning signs of this? I don't know, because we just, we haven't seen that play out. But what I can tell you is that I think that every company in Silicon Valley is pressured to grow. But I think that there are certain leaders who may have pause, who may have done things a little bit differently, even at the expense sometimes of this kind of growth that we're, that we're seeing. I do, I do think that maybe other leaders might have worried a little more about the, the legacy or just the problem mm. or the baggage. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, did you see any change from the top over time in any way? <sighs> you know, 
It's hard to say. I think I think fundamentally no, mm. to be honest. From, from what I've seen, yeah. growth is still very much the top priority for Facebook. Yes, they have some more safeguards now. I would say they have more of an awareness of the negative consequences of putting growth above everything else. Um, but growth is still number one. I mean, Facebook's in it's kind of in survival mode right now. It's in war mode, right? It's trying to beat TikTok. Its user base is getting old and uncool. It is sinking millions and millions of dollars into uh, the metaverse. It needs to make money. It needs to execute on its vision. It's taking some big risks and it's facing huge threats that it's never faced before on this level. So this is not a time to sit and stop and do thought experiments and, and you know, <laughs> ponder the meaning of Facebook and its impact on the world. Like, I don't think they, I just don't think given their business priorities that they even have the, um, the incentive to, mm. to not focus on growth. They need to do that if they want to remain a, a company with a, a strong position in the economy. The term incentive is so loaded for me. Like there's so much to unpack there for me. To what extent is the issue that they're just operating in a circumstance where the incentive structure is not set up for them to do what needs to be done? Or is that too reductive? And like you can make space for what you need to do to protect democracy. Um, I think those are questions far beyond, right? Like Meta's control. And mm -hmm. so maybe that shifts some of the blame from Meta onto the larger financial and economic systems. But I do think like, again, there's ways to, to reduce harm. And I think there's an argument that all this controversy that Facebook gets itself in that it thinks is a distraction, like let's say misinformation or anti-democratic, uh, you know, movements happening on the platform or, you know, COVID hoaxes. I think all of that ends up harming the company or user privacy mm -hmm. issues because all of that actually impacts user trust and all of that kind of maybe leads to users not being as excited about using Facebook as other platforms. And I also think, look, I think the responsibility at this point is beyond meta. I think also there's a question of, well, why should we trust a company that has repeatedly made mistakes to then correct itself? Why, wh at what point should government step in, Yeah. right? At what point do they need actual change in the laws to compel them to to walk the walk this is the united states of anxiety i'm kai wright you're listening to our producer kusha navadar in conversation with shireen Gafari, host of the podcast land of the giants they're talking about the future of meta and what we can learn from the company's story as we navigate our own lives online Take a break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm Kai Wright. We've been talking this week about the moral and ethical questions we confront in our digital lives. And they're not always simple answers to those questions. As our producer Kusha Navadar pursued the story of Facebook and how it has or has not answered these questions, we got curious to hear from other tech workers. I'm John Clark. I'm currently a PhD candidate studying how we can better anticipate the impacts of AI. My name is Jackie and I'm a product manager for healthcare products. What responsibility, if any, do you feel about the use of the technology that you're helping create? I think as a product manager, you have a lot of responsibility for the products you create. But I think there are small trade-offs that you have to make when you're looking at a product in order to figure out, for example, should I collect more data to improve the product? And I think that is definitely a bit of tension between user goals and then also company goals. And that's sort of what you try to navigate and prioritize. When you were entering your field or looking for a job, did you think consciously about the ethics of what you would be working in? Yes. Basically, I recognized that the impacts of AI are going to be so profound that there's a lot of potential to have positive social benefit by doing good work in that space. I've become acutely aware of the negative mental health impacts that social media can often have on Instagram or Facebook. We see these highly curated snippets of the best moments in people's lives. 
but we see our own lives in their totality with all the pain and disappointment and frustration and failure. The sample we get through our curated feeds is not necessarily representative of how our friends actually live and what they believe. And so we have to be very careful not to get a skewed sense of what our social circles actually are like. Kusha actually has some personal experience in the industry as well. And it came up in his conversation with reporter Shireen Ghaffari. You know, I I worked at Google, actually, for a little while, about 10 years ago. And I remember, uh, I still do, I feel proud of the people that I worked with and everyone that I worked with seemed to carry that same ethos. And being removed from the tech industry now, but looking back and and seeing the kind of trajectory of the world, it makes me wonder, like, what was my responsibility being on the inside, being somebody who helped make these products, quote unquote, better, however you want to define that, whether for good reasons or bad, like, how much responsibility did I have? And should there be something different with the way that I operated? And I'm not sure if you could answer that. But how does that resonate for you when you think about not just the leaders, but the people inside these companies? You should have shared anything at all bad or controversial with the reporter, and then you would have done your due, your, your due diligence. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I just went but... into the industry instead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I joke. I do think, though, um, transparency honestly can help. I think we know a lot more about companies like Facebook and Google and Twitter, thanks in part due to employees who have brought information to the public via journalists or however they may want to, if they want to bypass journalists, I understand. Um, But I do think at some point, if you are trying to make change from within and it's not happening, I think there is obviously an argument that that some information should be public. And I think these companies should share more. I think they don't share nearly enough. And it's not just Facebook, all, all the big tech companies about what exactly is going on. And unfortunately, there's just this very small segment of society who are people who work at Google or Facebook who really even come close to even understanding how these black boxes work. Mm. Um, So that is a great responsibility. I really do think so. Now, do I think every person in there is going to be able to change this massive ship, this massive, massive um, like Leviathan, you know, like company that they're working for if you're just a a product manager or you're an engineer? I don't know. But I I do think that... um, that, that anyone who works at a tech company is is sort of in a place of privilege if if you if you feel like you you know you have any kind of say and you feel a certain way I would say advocate for it because there's not many people who even come close to that level of of proximity in your most recent episode you talk about some of the challenges that meta now has been confronting more recently how would you compare what they're dealing with recently versus the challenges further back in the past? I think it's different in that the people reacting are different. So you see the same kind of backlash where Facebook introduces a change, people are upset, the company maybe apologizes, makes some minor tweaks, but doesn't really fundamentally change course. It still doubles down on its true vision. Mm-hmm. That that pattern's still, I would say, happening. But I think what's different is that the people who are reacting to Facebook now are not just college kids. It's politicians. It's people you know, in the U.S., on both sides of the aisle, distrust Facebook and its political intentions and feel like the, you know, that, that Facebook has its thumb on the scale either way. So now they're, they're basically upsetting a more powerful group of people who are not just students in its, in its early days. Facebook was only students. Now it is world leaders. Now it is, you know, people all over the globe. Now it is other CEOs and, and powerful people who use this platform and rely on it in some ways. And you know, or as we're seeing with Instagram now, it's also these celebrities, right? Like yeah. um, Kylie Jenner coming out and saying like she doesn't like what they're doing to Instagram. That has more of an effect. And that's those are sort of like bigger problems to reckon with uh, than even 60,000 college students because these are people who kind of have the power to make or break your platform in some ways. And I think that's where now maybe the company is forced to be a little more reactive than in its early days. Yeah, and the requests they receive seem to come with increasing pressure and complexity. Uh, There's a story earlier this summer, Nebraska police got private Facebook messages from Meta between a teenager and her mom to investigate an alleged abortion. 
So if you missed the story, let me quickly lay out the facts. These two people are facing criminal charges related to the alleged abortion and mishandling of the fetal remains. And later, Meta released a statement saying the warden hadn't mentioned abortion and the company received it before Roe v. Wade was overturned. But the point of the matter is that Facebook shared information about about this person's very personal matter, right? And at a time right now when there's so much anxiety and real fear that women are going to be prosecuted for, you know, what they do with their bodies because of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So it's also just the moment that this revelation comes in, even though this whole incident happened pre the Roe v. Roe v. Wade being overturned, which is what Facebook keeps saying in its defense, but that doesn't Again, it's a very PR type of reaction to this fundamental problem that they are ignoring and not really addressing, which is what are you going to do when the government comes knocking on your door asking for more and more information about, you know, people's private lives? Yeah. Um, and that's going to happen more with, with what's happened with Roe v. Wade. It's going to happen every day. You know, it's going to become routine. So I think this kind of case is the first we're hearing, but there's probably been more in the past and there will be many more in the future. And it's uh, hard for me to hear a story like that and not think about the future of our, our data and our de- identities online. Like, is, is it even possible to say what that future looks like? I kind of personally tend to dismiss a lot of, you know, privacy concerns about data on social media companies, at least in my own life. But something like this makes you pause, makes you think, wait a second, you know, we can't always anticipate a conversation that me and you are having today that we may think is perfectly legal and fine may become illegal tomorrow in the world we're living in, right? Mm-hmm. And, and at times of kind of political change and a changing of, uh, of people's values in this country. So that's a little scary um, to think that these companies kind of have a log on you of every conversation you've had and these things could be used against you in a court of law for sure i gotta say as an individual it feels like i'm often at the whim of whatever a company decides to do if i depend on that platform if i want to be a part of economic activity social activity anything am i powerless or are there things that i can do to take back agency I think there absolutely are things you can do. And again, I think it's kind of like voting, even if as an individual person you think, oh, this is pointless, it's just a, a drop in the bucket. We know in the in the whole it isn't, right? And same thing with what apps you choose to use. If you really don't like an app, there are alternatives. So right now, a lot of people are talking about the potential of crypto, the metaverse, obviously, Web 3.0, all of these buzzwords, but they are real technologies and they could make a real difference in the future. So another decade from now, do you think we're going to have similar stories about how these technologies showed so much promise, but ended up creating great harm? And there were there was a canary in the coal mine that we could have pointed to. Yeah, I I think we're already having those conversations. And so I really think this is where, you know, Facebook or Meta does have a chance to do it better. It's early. We'll see. They, they're they saying, they're promising they will, that they've learned lessons from the past. They're saying they're catching stuff earlier, but we are hearing some of the same early problems, I'd say. I think they may be getting a little faster at fixing it. There was one report about a user testing group for one of Facebook's Metaverse products, which is their um, kind of like hangout social space called um, Horizon. And a female, you know, a woman who is a user tester in there said that she was being uh, like virtually groped by other users, by, by male users in the metaverse. And, you know, it's <sighs> Facebook, you know, they caught it and they start to introduce these kind of bubbles. So they say now that if you're in the metaverse, your avatar cannot like automatically go up to another, another avatar. Uh, you have kind of a personal safety net around you. And I think that's an example of, okay, not great that this happens. Like, couldn't they have thought of this sooner? But on the other hand, it's not like it rolled out to, it wasn't like already mass, a mass adopted tool the way that Facebook was when it was being used for genocide, right? This is still Mm. relatively niche. And this is still something that they're seeing and user testing maybe before the product fully launches. So, you know, I think we'll see. I think even with a company like Meta, I want to, I want to give them a chance to see if they really improve, even though if in the past they've made repeated mistakes. And I do think we're definitely going to see all the same problems about bullying, harassment, misinformation, I think maybe even more amplified. Because if you think about it, this metaverse vision, if it's fully executed, 
feels more lifelike. It feels more immersive. It, there's more senses involved. Mm. This groping, it felt more personal than if someone were to type out that I'm groping you because it's actually like you feel like you're in an alternate world and this avatar is coming toward what you feel like is you know a, a version of your physical body. And you can think of how far this goes. What if we start to introduce actual touch? There are like sensors and things that can recreate you know feelings that we don't experience right now in our kind of 2D digital worlds. So I think we have to be more concerned about these problems and just, you know, I think give feedback and give it early. I'm glad that that user tester shared her experiences, right? What surprised you the most about Facebook story? That's a good question. I would say just how much they were worried about competition at every stage. I mean, I think it's you know, I, I always thought that Facebook was number one and it has been for so many years for like nearly two decades. It's kind of been the biggest social media company in the world. But I think now more than ever with TikTok, I am understanding just how much at any point in time, Instagram before Facebook bought it could have, could have overtaken. WhatsApp before they bought it could have overtaken. Twitter, Vine, what have you. All these companies are constantly kind of threatening Facebook's existence and um, some of them, Facebook wins because they buy them, like Instagram and WhatsApp. Others, like let's say with Twitter, Facebook's just better at scaling and growing and monetizing, and all those, all those, you know, great values we talked about are ultimately what helps them win. And I think what was surprising to me was just how much, just how fragile Facebook um, saw itself at times, and how it never sort of like rested on its laurels. And I think it needed to do that. And, and as, as bad as the company was at seeing around corners regarding the societal impact, regarding Cambridge Analytica or Russian misinformation or what have you, they are great at seeing around corners with competition most of the time. Mm. I think maybe until really TikTok, they, they really saw, oh crap, we gotta do something about mobile. We're gonna buy Instagram or, oh, people are messaging each other a lot and, and not using you know Facebook necessarily do so. We gotta get WhatsApp or you know we're gonna copy Snapchat stories feature because people aren't into posting photos on the grid. They want to share more ephemeral content. And so I, I think that was what was surprising to me is just how much Facebook is always looking over its shoulder and good at, at shifting to win. They're good at looking over their shoulder for the competition, but not for maybe the good or bad of society sometimes. So what do you hope people take away from all the reporting you've done about the Facebook meta story? There's so much, there's so much controversy about Facebook. And I think people, a lot of people are just so critical of the company. And on the other hand, people inside the company are so, you know, they, they feel that that criticism is overblown a lot of the time, right? And they, they get defensive about it. And so what I really want people to do is whether you're critical or more positive about social media, I want you to be able to kind of understand the other side and maybe take away something where you go actually to Facebook's credit here that may have not been an intentional mess up. There may have been some things out of their control that contribute to this. On the other hand, I want people inside the tech industry to understand, hey, here's where we can stop and reflect and actually maybe think that something went wrong. And I, I hope we're doing that. Yeah. Thank you so much for spending the time and also for your reporting. Yeah, it was such a pleasure. This was so fun. Thanks for having me. I love you guys' work. And That was our producer, Kusha Navadar, in conversation with Shireen Ghaffari. She's a senior reporter at Recode and co-host of Land of the Giants, which is a podcast that examines how the biggest tech companies rose to power. The season explores how Meta, formerly Facebook, arrived at this moment of transition. And Kusha, you know, what really struck me in that conversation was Shireen's whole reflection that even if there hasn't been a mass exodus from Facebook, there has been a gradual march, you know, like empires do fall. Yeah, Kai. And, you know, for me, it's personal. A lot of times I feel stuck about where I need to be online. And I bet a lot of other people feel that way, too. Yeah. So, like, how do you choose and what do you do when those options come with baggage? Like with Facebook, it creates some harm in the world. Indeed. And it goes back to our question from our first segment. Have you listening had to make a tough call in your life when a choice you made created some moral harm? What was that choice? How did you make it? Email us. The address is anxiety at WNYC.org and bonus points if it's a voice memo. Okay. Thanks, Kusha. Thanks, Kai. That's it for tonight. 
The United States of Anxiety is a production of WNYC Studios. Sound designed by Jared Paul. Joe Plord mixed this episode. Matthew Morando is our live engineer. Our team also includes Emily Botin, Regina Dehir, Karen Frillman, Kushan Avadar, and Rahima Nasa. I'm Kai Wright. You can keep in touch with me on Twitter and Instagram at Kai underscore Wright. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week.